Welcome back to the channel. My name is Andrew Fillion, and today we're going to be answering a very common question that a lot of new people in the crypto space ask. If cryptocurrency isn't a physical token, if I can't actually hold it, how is it exactly a currency? Today we're going to be breaking down exactly why that is, but first I want us to be all on the same page. We're going to be going over the history of what a currency even is. This way we can truly understand how exactly crypto has become a currency. Let's start things out by going all the way back to the beginning of civilization. There's many civilizations, a lot of them were moving concurrently throughout history together. Maybe not in the same places, but in the same time frame. Each of them had some way to trade and barter with one another. How would they do this? Well, they had to find something out in the world, something they could collect, that they all agreed was mutually beneficial for their communities. It had some sort of intrinsic value. In some parts of the world, this was ivory. In some parts of the world, this were seashells, clam shells, things that you would find in the sea. Other places discovered gemstones. Throughout the annals of history, eventually there is going to be one common metal that every culture agreed upon that they wanted to use. You guessed it, that was gold. Gold became the default currency for most of human history, even up including to today, maybe not quite at the same levels, but everybody can agree that gold is desirable. Everyone wants gold, everyone wants to trade with gold. It's fungible, it's tough, it's usable in a lot of different applications, but a lot of people also like the way it looks. So it has these properties that make people want to collect it, want to trade with it, and want to use it as a store of value. But gold has some inherent problems. The biggest elephant in the room, gold is very heavy. You might be able to transport a couple grams of gold, a couple ounces, but the weight of gold really does start to add up very fast. In ancient times, this was solved by minting coins. Sometimes you'd have gold coins, but sometimes you would also have other metals like bronze and silver that weighed considerably less. Society agreed that these assets could be interchangeable with gold to get around the weight issue. As civilizations would progress, eventually paper money was invented. That's what everyone uses today. I use it, you use it, we're all familiar with paper money. Paper money does definitely solve a problem. You take something that is extremely heavy like gold, you add a monetary value to it, and now you're able to transport far more money in your own wallet than you ever possibly could by lugging around gold everywhere you went. Now let's say that the $20 bill still represented a gram of gold. That's great, there's nothing wrong with that, but you're eventually going to run into a problem. Even the $20 bill, it's eventually going to run into the same problem that all of the other currencies did. Let's say you're trying to transport entire kilograms of gold. Maybe it's your entire life savings. Maybe you have a war chest of gold that you've been accumulating for your entire life. Are you really going to keep all of that in $20 bills? That's not only going to eventually become very heavy in itself, it's going to take up a considerable amount of space. I mean, think about it. Would you really want to keep $20 bills in a U-Haul in your driveway for your entire life? If you are a gold millionaire and you were representing that gold with $20 bills, that is something that you would have to do. Paper money didn't really solve the problem. It just kicked the can down the road. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the show Breaking Bad. Do you remember in the last season when Walter White had all of this money, but he had nothing that he could actually do with it? In the show, he kept his money in a storage unit, and the storage unit eventually accumulated so much money, mind you, this is a television show, that it rose midway up the walls, eventually getting to the ceiling. That actually is a real problem, maybe not for you and I, but if you think at the institutional level, there has to be something that you can do with all of this cash. Well, in the TV show, he eventually transported that into chemical barrels. And if you remember, in one episode in particular, he had to roll this barrel through the desert. It was so heavy that he couldn't even lift it. This is what happens when you have real-world physical assets. And as we move towards a digital age, this just becomes obsolete, unnecessary, and it is going to get phased out. Now to really try to drive this home, think about music. Let's say the new Beatles album, White, came out. You wanted to listen to the White album. You had to go to a record store. First, you had to have a record player. So you get the record player, then you get the album. If you wanted more albums, you had to go back to the record store and get more. Eventually inside your own house, you'd have a large storage of musical albums that would take up an entire room. 
Not a big deal if you've only got a couple albums, but if you wanted to have a robust music collection, you could see how this could become a problem. On top of that, if you want to listen to the music, you can only do it where your record player is. People much smarter than me eventually figured out we can take this music and put it into something far more transportable. Enter the cassette tape and CDs. Now instead of being stuck in a room to listen to your music, you've got these smaller devices, CD players and cassette players, that can play all kinds of stuff. Let's say you're in the car, you're on a date, you want to put on the Backstreet Boys. You meet up with the guys later, you want to put on some hip hop. Let's say you're at the skate park, you want to put on some Red Hot Chili Peppers. People would go out and get albums that they would either stick their cassette tapes or their CDs into. And eventually, once again, this can that was kicked down the road becomes another problem. There's more music in the world than you could possibly store on a bunch of cassettes and CDs that you keep inside your own house. This problem would continue until someone came along by the name of Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs created the MP3 player. Now, music was stored in files that could be kept on a small device, something much like this that would eventually become the iPhone. Where you once had trouble listening to all different kinds of music in your cassette player or in your CD player, now you had everything on one single device. And you could use this device to jump from song to song. You want to listen to Backstreet Boys? Go for it. You want to listen to hip hop? You want to listen to Red Hot Chili Peppers? It's all good because it's all on the same device. But just like everything that came before it, you eventually run into the exact same problem. Uh-oh, now your iPod is maxed out on storage. Once again, what do we do? We kick the can down the road by making bigger MP3 players. You go from one gigabyte, now you got the four, now you got the eight, the 16, the 32. It goes on and on, but it never truly solves that original problem. What do you do to maintain all of this storage? It wasn't until about 10 years ago that the ultimate solution was found. Apple Music, Spotify, now you've got streaming services. You have the world at your fingertips. You can play any song that you want at any time. It's never stored on your actual device. This iPhone right here could play millions upon millions of songs, and it's actually arguably smaller than the original iPods were. In terms of music, this has finally been figured out. We're living in the digitization era. Things can come and go and be transferred without having to be stored locally so that you're able to get what you want and then send it back when you're done with it. In the case of streaming, you can get whatever song or video or movie, you name it. You can get these sent directly to your device, do what you will with it, and then when you're done, you just put it away. It's never saved locally on your device. Now I want you guys to think what that means in terms of our current civilization. Things have all gone digital. We live in an age where data and information is transparent. It flows freely. We no longer need to have physical assets in order to realize things. You used to have to have a physical record player and a physical record to get music. That's no longer the case. Now you're able to stream those musics to your device. You're getting the same music, but you no longer have the physical assets, the record player, the record. You can extrapolate this idea to almost anything in the world right now. So where do we run into the problem with currencies? Well, there's two major problems in the world that is actually still an ongoing issue. One, we have to deal with very slow remittance. What is remittance? It's the delivery and mailing of money. See, we live in this digital era, but there's a big problem. All the money that we have in banks, it still actually gets physically transported around. If you've been in Chicago or New York or other large cities, you've probably seen these armored vehicles going from bank to bank collecting money. Well, not only is that kind of a security risk, and we'll cover how crypto handles security in another video, but you also have to deal with the actual physical assets and how slow it is to get this money from point A to point B. If you wanted to send money right now from New York City to Australia, it would be faster for you to get on an airplane and fly it there than it would be to go through our current remittance protocols. If you've ever used Venmo before, you're probably already aware of this to some extent. When somebody sends you money, on the checkout screen you've got two options. You can either get your money instantly 
or you can wait two to three business days. Well, what happens when you hit that instant button? Venmo is going to credit you whatever that balance is, but they're going to take a fee. That's because Venmo is not actually getting the money that was transferred to you until about two or three days later. So they're upfronting this cash and charging a fee in the process. In the digital era, it's not only possible to send and receive money nearly instantly, we're able to do so with extremely low transaction fees, so low that you don't even notice that they're there. Now, some of you might be thinking that this is a couple years away. It's not. This is happening right now. You might not be using it, but there are people in the world right now that do transact with cryptocurrencies. They're buying things, they're selling things, and they're moving money from point A to point B instantly and with minimal fees. Now this is happening on a micro level. It's more peer to peer at this given time, but that won't always be the case. We used to be in the wild west of cryptocurrency. The first people to adopt it were using it for less than savory things, illegal activities, black market activity, you name it. But that's the wild west. We're now moving towards the industrialized era of cryptocurrencies where institutions, banks, and countries are looking to move over from the physical fiat form of currency into cryptocurrencies. Not only does it make sense, it's inevitable. We live in a world where everything comes to you instantly. Text messages, videos, music, email. Any of the things I just listed to you can be available to you almost instantly. In fact, when you clicked on this video, it probably started within less than a second of you hitting on that thumbnail. Imagine if you could do that with money, how it would improve productivity around the world, especially in the finance sector. This isn't just theory. This is really going to happen. And the people that are early adopters of it will win the most. Now, when it comes to cryptocurrencies, I know there's a lot of people out there that have been burned by scammers and influencers telling them to buy this coin or that coin. There's a lot of meme coins out there that are not worth your time, not worth spending any money on. And I don't recommend buying meme coins myself. But there's going to be industry-driven coins out there already available, the big ones you've probably already heard of. Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, XRP, Cardano. These large coins already have hundreds of billions in market cap. They're too big for the scammers to be able to manipulate. My money and your money is not going to be moving any of these large coins, even a penny. We are effectively grains of sand in a larger sandcastle. It's the big banks, the institutions, the nations. Those are the ones driving current market prices. All that we can hope to do is be like a flea latching onto a mammoth. And that's what I want to help people also get into, because once this thing really takes off, yeah, you'll always be able to buy it. But the exponential growth that we're all expecting, it's not going to last forever. Personally, there are three coins that I recommend more than anything else. I do like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Solana, but they're not in my top three. My top three, the number one is going to be very obvious. It's XRP. XRP by a mile is, in my opinion, going to be the most important cryptocurrency in our lifetime. But it has some companion coins right behind it that I think are going to pair up very well with it. The second being HBAR and the third being Flare on the Flare network. The reason for HBAR, it's able to transact so fast, even faster than XRP, it can handle up to 10,000 transactions per second. If you think about large volume, you're going to have a lot of different entities moving money being able to move 10,000 transactions per second, it's going to make it so this ecosystem moves fast even at large scales. XRP can only handle 1,500 transactions per second, which is still phenomenal, not quite as fast as HBAR. Why am I so bullish on XRP then? It's because it already has the partnerships that HBAR doesn't quite have yet. I think it's a great idea to have both of these. And then why do I like Flare so much? Flare is positioning itself to be the ultimate XRP sidekick. If XRP is Batman, Flare wants to be Robin. I really like this integration and collaboration between the two networks. XRP is able to do tremendous things, but it doesn't really have native built-in staking. Flare is going to be the token that changes all of that. We're already able to combine our XRP and our Flare tokens to mint what they call Flare assets, which is 
FXRP, this is a token that will generate passive yield. It already exists. It's very new. It just came out this year. I myself am still experimenting with it, so I don't necessarily want to endorse it quite yet, but I am excited for it. I do believe Flare has earned its spot as the number three coin behind XRP and HBAR. Now there's plenty of other really good coins too. SWE, XLM, Ondo, Chainlink. There's a lot of great utility tokens. You can find most of these on coinmarketcap.com. Anything that's in the top 20, you don't have to be worried about scammers or rug pullers getting at your money. These are going to be institutional level coins. I highly recommend if you want to be a smart investor, an investor that buys and holds for long-term gains, stay away from some of the things that you might have heard of like fartcoin or pump.fun 401jk. These are the ones that have been kind of making the rounds lately. It is at the end of the day your money. You can do what you like with it. I don't recommend getting involved. You may end up getting rug pulled. There's plenty of meme coins out there. You can find hundreds of them that people are going to say is the next opportunity to 10x, 100x your money. I really don't recommend anybody get involved in these. I know some people want to gamble and hey, some people are going to win. A lot of people are going to lose. If you do want to take that risk, by all means take it. But it's not something I can personally endorse. On this channel, I'm a long holder. I don't really believe in day trading or actively managing your portfolio. I believe in buying assets and holding onto them for 10 or more years and not liquidating your asset unless there's a specific reason that you need to. Maybe you're looking at buying a house. Maybe your water heater breaks. There's use cases to liquidate a little bit when you need the cash, but I would never sell just because you made a profit. We're buying and holding this not because it's going to make us rich, but because it's the future of finance. Getting rich is just going to be a side effect of that. On this channel, I'd like to get more in depth about why I like XRP, HBAR, and Flare. There's going to be more videos on these topics specifically coming out in the very near future. So if you liked what you've heard so far, make sure to like the video, leave a comment. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And third, if you really want to help grow this channel, the best way to support it is to actually share the video. It's the number one metric that YouTube looks for in terms of helping channels go viral. Now, I don't necessarily aim to be the biggest channel here on YouTube, but the more people I can reach in the XRP and cryptocurrency space, the better. So you'd be helping me and also helping your fellow peers as we move into this new cryptocurrency ecosystem. With that, I think I'm going to leave this video here. There'll be plenty more in the near future. Until next time, I've been Andrew. Until next time, I've been Andrew Fillion, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care.